Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we are one on one with the founder of Crystal Digital Network Solutions and a member of the advisory, Technical Advisory Council for Oyo State, Temitokwe Ogunsemo. He is a member of the Nigerian Computer Society, Nigerian Internet Group, and British Computer Society. Mr. Ogunsemo is very passionate about continued development of innovative, robust, and secure informative technology environment in the educational sector. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, you've played a huge role in the education sector. Why did you choose this sector and what's your driving force? Mm. So, um, for me, it's not really about the sector. Okay. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, um, I like to see problems. I like to see challenges. And wherever I see an opportunity, I take advantage or I try to provide solutions. and. Uh, one of the areas that I saw, one of the sectors that I saw a major issue was the education sector and okay. I decided to provide solutions there. So what was the need you noticed at the time? Okay, so um, I went to a public school in Lagos. You can call it a very, very big school and one of the foremost public schools in Nigeria. My school was about 100 years at the time I left the school and um, they were still used to all of these manner means of operation, uh, and which almost cost me uh, my university uh, admission abroad. As a result of, um, I wanted my transcript. Yeah, I, when I was done from the high school, I needed to get my transcript so I could uh, put in application for my course abroad. And for some reasons, the school has, you know, couldn't present that transcript. Uh, it was also about the time where political period where you had the ministerial nominees and stuff, who, which they wanted to confirm someone, and they couldn't even present the uh, names of people who actually went through the school and one of the nominees, you know. So, fast forward some years after that, I've gone, to, I'd gone to school, I'd returned, I was already doing technology and. I found that this same problem was still there, and mm -hmm. I decided to go in and say I can provide solution. Okay, so how, how far has this solution um, provided what? Education in Nigeria is a very regulated environment. Uh, maybe not just education, but because it's a federal government, educa federal government college, uh, it's not an area where, as a service provider, you can just go in and tell them uh, this is what they need to do. I mean, it's a, it's a big issue. But for me, uh, it was about what they needed, what they could not do without. Uh, as I speak to you today, all of the federal government colleges in Nigeria currently run on the solution that are built. So I think that uh, if it's not something that's, that is making a lot of difference in their lives or in the schools, I'm not sure they would, I mean, not, you won't have over 100 people adopt the solution. Mm. So this solution is called My School Portal. Yeah, My School Portal. And it's, like you said, over 100 schools have embraced it. Yes. Are there any tertiary institutions in, on this list? So, um, like I said, uh, Nigeria is a very regulated, I mean, anything that has to do with government and sectors, you know, it's a very regulated. So, uh, I mean, if I want to start having conversation, I even broke into the one and you know the one from one to the over a hundred of them now i mean you won't live here okay um so tertiary is another another ball game entirely right um they have their own autonomy maybe it was easier maybe it was a lot easier because federal government colleges has one umbrella maybe under the minister of education and maybe the permanent secretary so it was easier to, you know, to go in, provide solution, and do a central system that the whole uh, federal government colleges can run on. For tertiary, it doesn't work that way. You know, the vice chancellor or the governing council would decide who they want to run. So it's, it's, so as we speak today, we have people doing several solutions in silos, but mm -hmm. not the kind of solutions that are currently running in the federal government colleges. Okay, but this same solution can actually work in the tertiary institution if you don't have the system that isn't making it work well, right? I must tell you, I mean, I mean, this is a fact. The solution we currently have in federal government colleges, uh, 
It's an enterprise solution that is quite robust, can work in any of the universities in Nigeria, even do much more than what they are currently running on. I can tell you that for a fact. Okay. When we talk about um, innovation in the education sector and we're having this conversation, what should be the key driving elements in order to get measurable success? The challenges are in different forms. And uh, it depends on what you're trying to solve. For instance, one of the first things that we came in to solve was how to digitize a lot of the manual means of operation. That's one. There is also an area where you're talking of curriculum is another one. There's also area or deliberation of whether schools should, I mean, policy makers of policy formulators should come together and really tell us this education we're talking about, or school, secondary school, primary school, certificates, are they really worth the while of brick and mortar schools? You know, now that you have a lot of open, invest, open, open sources around the world, so, so there are quite a number of things to, to think about and to measure them based on. So if you, with that uh, question, I mean, it's big. You have to narrow it down to a particular thing, then I can tell you how to measure on this and measure on that. But education sector mm. on its own is huge. It's, okay. it's huge. So as of 2018, your company was evaluated to be about $3 million um, company. You are a key player in this industry. Would you say it's been easy to collaborate with the governments to get the solutions out there? Or would you say you need more enabling environment? No, I think that, um, truth be told, government has really, um, they've been there for us. And I can't lie to you about that. Uh, we started out sometime in 2009. And uh, it was easy, I mean, could have been very easy for any government to come and say, you know what, you guys, we don't want you guys to play in this sector. Um, having access to all the database of all the federal government colleges, if they are not being fair to you, they can actually have the right to say no, go. So I think that, yes, they've been there, but enabling environments, maybe for us and other players to play and do more. Because if you look at the challenges in this country, um, it's not enough for everybody to sit back and say, oh, government is not doing this, government is not doing that. Even if you look at the budget, it's a very challenging, uh, it's a challenging environment. So you need the private sector to come in and do whatever they can uh, in that sector, So, and which is what the government is doing. Now, in every environment, yes, I know they can do more, but where they are now, I, I don't think they're really doing bad for a lot of the service providers that are coming on board. But yes, I mean, we're good. OK, you mentioned database. But before we go into data collection and information we have, let's go on a very quick break. And when we come back, we'll carry on this conversation. Welcome back. We still have 10 minutes of where Ogun Shemo with us. And this is one on one on Plus TV Africa. So before we went on that quick break, you said something about the government giving you access to a certain database to get your job, make your job easier. Um, we cannot overemphasize the importance of data when it comes to policy making and decision making. Now, um, how far would you say we have gone in information gathering for data in Nigeria, aside looking at the education sector? I think the only thing that is um, stopping us, not only in Nigeria, in Africa, is data, is identity. Okay. It's a major issue. Um, I don't think we're there at all. We're not even there at all. And I can't even lie to you. It's an, it's an, an area that I'm quite interested in. Uh, we're about 1.2 billion people in Africa. Uh, if you compare other continents, try and see what they've done. You can imagine if you have verified data of Africa, or you come to Nigeria over 200 million people alone, and you build a unicorn solution, you can imagine what we'll do. If you flip it on the other side, try and see what they're doing in the Western world. See what eBay has done. See what PayPal, see what they you go to Asia, you see what Alibaba, AliExpress, what they are all doing. Everybody is thinking in that direction. I think it's a huge, huge problem here. And um, until the government really realize the benefits, mm. I'm not sure that um, 
that that promised land we all have been hoping for that we're going to meet up that promised land anytime soon mm -hmm. um data is a major issue um and if you think of what is going on in nigeria if you think of the kind of data we currently have in nigeria um maybe the most verified data now will be the bvn how many BVN? maybe over 20 plus million people uh, you have over 100 people with mobile telephony i mean that's a, that's a key for you. That's a major data, but those data are not verified. You have more mobile phones than more account numbers in Nigeria. You understand? So data is almost everything. And you see a whole lot of businesses not thriving in Nigeria just because of data. So many things can happen. If only data, you have verified data. You have identity. Identity is a big issue, not only in Nigeria, everywhere outside the country. But you see a lot of countries that have done very well in the Western world. They took advantage of the data that they have. Data is everything. Who are you? You want to collect money. They want to know you up to your house. It's possible. Nigeria is almost impossible. People, I mean, outside the country, you see people talking about public funds, talking about social security. I don't know that we have anything like that. And I don't even know when we're going to. How do we even plan? It's a major issue. Mm. It's a very big issue. So if you are going to advise Mr. President on this issue and make him understand the importance of data to our development, where would you advise him to start from and what would you tell him is the importance of data to us? Yeah, so, so just recently, yeah, um, I'm going to give kudos to them. I, one of my staff yesterday went to, uh, wanted to renew our international passport. So she came back to the office and said to me, they said, you need NIMC number. You want to, almost everything now, they ask you for NIMC number, even though it's not very convenient, uh, but that's what they're asking. So meaning they, they're trying to unshake the current data they have. Okay. Now, uh, that's good, but the NIMC, how available, how accessible, how easy is it for every normal person to have these numbers? That would be another question. If you want to generate data, you need to make enough resources available for people to have access to that data or to be registered on that data. So I think that that's the challenge. I don't know. Um, even myself, my international passport, for instance, will expire sometime next year. I'm told that to renew that passport now, I need to get NIMC. The NIMC you're talking about, some years back, I went and registered. Up to now, I don't even have a, I don't even have a number. I don't even have the registration, what is it called? So same thing has come. Now they're saying you must go and register on that NIMC. I think that this NIMC, for instance, should be almost everywhere. Should be tied. I like that it's there, almost tying it to everything. I mean, if you work in a place, your staff must have NIMC. You want to file tax clearance, you must bring your NIMC of your, your, your empl uh, employees. Things like that. You want to, you're, you're in, a, in a school, before you pay your school fees, you must have a number. We want to know you. That's a number that identifies you. It's very good, but let these numbers be... Uh, let these vendors who are running these things be more, more and also efficient, more uh, maybe in terms of turnaround time. Because mm -hmm. I even heard that my friend that went, my staff that went there yesterday, went and registered and they said it would take maybe another few weeks before they would bring back. It seems that when the solutions come out, there's always a problem. It's either the turnaround time, like you said, or it's not seamless, or it's way stressful. Regardless of what we talk about our issues in Nigeria, we can say that we have very good tech, tech guys and programmers and software guys. Where does the problem lie? Is it that they don't, the government is not working with the right set of people, or the people that are available in this part of the world cannot carry out the... Um, they, they, are not, they don't know the, technical, the technicalities of creating this database. What exactly is our problem? Just to response, just to... Mm -hmm. Number one, um, for me, would be technical know-how. Mm -hmm. That's one. Then number two is the political will. Uh, now, if I give you an example of why I give to those two um, reasons. One, if you think about when they started saying we should do the mobile phone registration. That took a couple of years. In the end, something went down. So you need political will, then you need technical know-how. Mm -hmm. If those two things are there, then we can get every, everything right. Because adaptability is an issue anywhere in the world.
Nobody wants to be pushed to do anything. So for you to say, you're comfortable to a particular thing and we want you to do, nobody, it, it's something that people are going to say no. So, but if the political will is there, whatever you would take, then you would ensure that people go on that, on that platform. So that's what I think it is. Mm. If we get that right, I think we'll be on the right uh, roadmap. Okay, so um, the Minister of Education in Nigeria, Damo Adamo, recently, a few months ago, said that the number of out-of-school children in the country has risen to about 16 million, or over 16 million. And this is um, a notable increase from 10.5 million as of 2013. Now, um, he's also blaming it on the high number of poor funding of education and all that. What is your take on this? Is our problem really poor funding or corruption? Because I'm a little bit close to the system, I think poor funding is one. Okay. Leave corruption aside. Mm. Poor funding is the main issue. If you look at the budget of education in Nigeria, I'm sure if you compare with some other budgets, maybe even in Nigeria or outside the country, you would see that it's a very easy far cry. The government comes out every year to say, or the political parties come out to say, we're committed to education, we're trying to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do... But when you look at the amount that has been disposed even for this education and for that sector, mm. it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. Maybe because I'm a little bit closer, I'm able to see a few things. It's almost impossible, and which is why I said to you that a lot of these things, I mean, it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come up. I mean, it's, and maybe not only in education, but several other areas, several other sectors like that in Nigeria. Government can't do everything, even outside the country. Government don't do everything. I was in Des Moines last, about, uh, about a month ago, at Drake University, and we had their governing body, they came, they usually have some meetings. You had people coming out saying that uh, I will give $5 million for this, I will give $10 million for this. It's almost difficult to find people do such thing here in Nigeria. But people respect system. They respect, and they, and they are saying for, I mean, a school that produces someone like them, they want to give $5 million, they don't need $5 million for this, they don't need $10 million for that. Government, are not, not, any, not in Nigeria, not anywhere in the world. You need the private people to come in to also do their own bit. Mm. So um, to say that the entire budget in the country you want to spend on education, I don't even know if that will be enough compared to where we are now and where we need to be. It will be, it will be difficult. In 2020, 2009, there was this projection that by 2020, Nigeria will be one of the most developed countries in the world. Mm. It's just for a few months away. A few weeks, actually. So I should ask you, are we there? Mm. So, I mean, it's a full talk for talks. Okay, let's go on a quick break. But when we come back, we'll talk about the role of EdTech in reducing the number of out of school children in Nigeria. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for still staying with us. Uh, Mr. Gosemo, so before we went on that break, you were talking about. You actually agreed with uh, the Minister of Education that the Minister of Education that the poor funding is one of the issues we have more children out of school. So my question now would be, since you play in the EdTech space, what role do you think EdTech can play to help reduce this number significantly? Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, if you look at the population of youth in Nigeria and compared to the number of schools and number of good schools, you would see that there is a whole lot of disparities. And that's how, if you go to the north, you find that a whole lot of people are already displaced and there are no schools. Now, um, what we as an ed tech provider, what we're doing is to provide, is to build a solution which we're currently even, um, we're currently even building the, the software that can allow people um, out of school, uh, students learn at their own pace without going to the school. Now, uh, like I said, Nigeria has, Nigeria education sector is a very regulated system. If you think of what happens maybe in an open university outside the country, 
For instance, if you go to maybe the University of Liverpool, a lot of people went to the University of Liverpool, didn't even go to a brick and mortar school. Some of them did it from here. And at the end of the day, they go there for graduation. It's not written there that you, you went, uh, you did an online school and stuff, which is a major. So adaptability in this part of the country is one issue. Mm -hmm. Regulatory is another issue. Um, maybe regulatory and adaptability over there, they, they were able to get it right. But I'm not sure that we're, a little, we're there yet. But of course, we can't stop providing this solution. Uh, I mean, by the time, I know there's Nigerian Open University. I don't know if there is a, um, I don't know if there are issues of you went to Nigerian Open University and you went to a normal university. And uh, I wasn't sure if, if you go to Open University, if you're able to serve here, or if you go to a normal university, I know you're able to serve. Those kind of things are the issues that even people who build solutions or come up with solutions like this have. Because when you think about it, for you to even make money as a business person, for instance, you need to think of the pros and cons. If what the solution you're providing in the end, you're going to have a lot of backstop, then it's going to be a major issue. But I mean, regardless, we are providing that solution because we think that's the new future, you understand? Also because we think that in the uh, solution, you have better curriculum to even work with than the current curriculum you have. You have. Mm -hmm. Think about even our curriculum, for instance. Um, what we currently even have, I don't even think that it's enough to keep us for another 10 years. I mean, we're in a disruptive environment. You can see a lot of things that are happening. You can't tell me that a lot of the things that we learned or we used to know in school back in the day is what will take us to another level mm -hmm. now. Uh, if you think of what is happening maybe in the Western world or even maybe even in Africa, if you go to Kenya, if you go to Rwanda, even from primary school, they've started adopting digital technology, adding coding into their curriculum. Mm -hmm. I don't think Nigeria is even thinking of that. And that's, that's where to go. There is disruption already in the system. Disruption does not, has nothing to do with, I went to university to read uh, biochemistry, or I went to read medicine. I went to, then it was the main kind of jobs or the main kind of profession to go into. But in the near future, it's almost not. I mean, you'll be seeing things like graphics design, things like coding, things like your programmer and stuff. Those are, that's where the next future jobs are. So it's important for, as a policymaker or as a government, to start to think in this direction and start to make some changes. So I think that with the kind of solution that we are providing, those kind of solutions will solve those problems. So it's not, it now takes, well, it's not left for the government to accept and adopt this kind of solution. So if I'm getting you right, this solution is online learning. It's on, well, it's online learning, open okay. source, yeah. Okay, so do you think we are at a place mentally and um, physically, like is our orientation good enough to embrace this form of learning at this time? Yeah, so like I said, nothing came to us, and we took it very joyfully. Mm -hmm. Over time, we're going to realize that that is the best form of learning. And it's even very convenient. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't like to be molecular to, to learn, and a lot of people don't like to be bullied to learn, you understand? So with this form of learning, you can learn at your own pace and go and write your either certification to move to the next level at your own pace. Mm -hmm. So and you can go back, there's, it allows for reflective learning, mm -hmm. where you can, the current system we have doesn't allow for maybe reflective learning. Now you can go review what you have done, check yourself, then you can go and write exam to say, okay, you're moving to the next level. Can, this form of learning, can it be applicable to our foundational education, primary education? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Okay. Of course, it will. All right. So um, there seems to be an increase in the reports of cyber crimes lately, and um, some people have decided to capitalize and stereotype us and say these are the people that come out of this part of the world. But would you say our educational system should be blamed for this, and are we channeling the tech idea wrongly? So uh, I mean, I was somewhere last week having this conversation, and. Yeah, some 
number of people in the environment are responsible for some of these um, cyber issues, right? But you would also agree with me that you have, in that also area, you, have, you still have some people who are making good use of the technology around them. I mean, you, you're seeing a lot of innovation hubs around the country. I mean, if you didn't have some of them, you have maybe even more people doing yao yao, if you get what I mean. So I think that the government or the people can spend more money to bring up a whole lot of more uh, idea hubs like this, which will reduce a lot of those cyber security uh, menace that we we hear about almost all the time. What advice would you give to the hardworking youths we have? Well, they need to pick the ones that are doing it right and make them their role model mm -hmm. and leave whatever is not working. I mean, for me, it's you're seeing a cup. It's either half full or half empty. It depends on how you see it. So, Maybe half full. Okay, so in your opinion, what is the next step for um, EdTech in Nigeria? If you think about most of the sectors, even in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, they've been disrupted. Mm -hmm. Sectors that you would, you would never think that could be disrupted. Are you talking of FinTech? Um, research even shows that with about 2 billion people having first uh, experience, mobile experience, mobile banking experience on their phone, then there will be nothing like banks mm. in the near future. Or there will be, I mean, with fintech companies, with this, they will disrupt that system, which they are already doing, even in Nigeria, we're experiencing it. If you go to health sector, health is another place where they say it's people's lives. So it's a very regulated environment. That, that sector has been disrupted. So, and that doesn't leave education sector, it doesn't leave them. So in the near future, even from now, I can see that a whole lot of people are coming up to disrupt that system. And I see that disruption in that sector might be that thing that will take us to promised land with, mm. with the education sector in Nigeria, considering the number of people, considering the um, amount, um, number of finance or funding that we have available to us. That solution would be disruption in the earth. So the solution we are looking for has to be disruptive. It has to be disruptive, yes. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you for watching. My name is Elsie Godwin. Do follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Plus TV Africa. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. We've been chatting with Mr. Temi Tokwe Ogunsemo, who is the founder of Crystal Digital Network Solutions. Thank you for watching. See you later. Mm -hmm.